Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Al Fontes. I'm president of the uh, Telegraph Hill Dwellers and glad to have you here. Just want to say activities like this are, you know, what we do. We try to bring the community together for a common purpose and um, we do all, oh, I just lost my notes, but um, we, we, uh, <laughs> we're, we're glad to have you here. We, we, we try to bring people together. We try to discuss things. We want to make North Beach a better place to live. And uh, that's enough for me. <laughs> Nick? Wonderful. Um, yeah, so uh, again, just want to uh, thank everyone for being here. Um, you know, today we've got a conversation with San Francisco, on San Francisco between District Attorney Chesa Boudin and uh, Chief of Police Bill Scott. Hmm. Um, thank you all for joining us. I think everyone knows the folks here uh, very well. Um, we're certainly very fortunate to have them. Um, I will do those some very brief intros um, on our panelists. So uh, first off, I'd like to introduce San Francisco's district attorney, Chesa Boudin. Uh, he was elected district attorney of San Francisco in November of 2019, uh, personally impacted by parental incarceration and the failings of the criminal justice system. DA Boudin was inspired to become a public defender and now decarceral prosecutor. He's focused on reforming the criminal justice system, making our community safer by developing data-driven policies to expand alternatives to incarceration and treat the root causes of crimes. So in his first few months in office, he's ended the office's practice um, of cash bail. He eliminated status enhancements, implemented California's first diversion program for primary caregivers, and ended the prosecution of charges resulting from racist pretextual traffic stops. Of course, there's a hell of a lot more I can say, and we will hear from the DA very shortly, uh, but welcome, District Attorney. Thank you so much, Nick, great to be with you. Um, so next up, we are also very grateful to be joined by San Francisco's police chief, Bill Scott. Uh, chief Scott was sworn in by Mayor Ed Lee on January 23rd, 2017, Prior to that, he was the deputy chief uh, in Los Angeles. Um, all in, I think he spent about 27 years there. His focus has been on community policing with an emphasis on implementing major reforms, especially as it relates to providing service with dignity and respect. Uh, one of the first steps of this endeavor was to create a, vi a viable and sustainable strategic plan to successfully implement the reform initiatives that are outlined in the Department of Justice's collaborative re review initiative performed on SFPD, um, while at the same time addressing public safety and reducing crime. We'll hear much more from him, but welcome, Chief Scott. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And lastly, I have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed moderator, Joe Eskenazi. Uh, many recognize Joe, I think. Uh, we've done events in the past together. Uh, Joe is the managing editor of Mission Local. And you know, when getting ready for this discussion, we thought, who better to moderate this than Joe? Um, he is a San Franciscan through and through, uh, born in the city, raised in the Bay Area, attended UC Berkeley. I believe even right now, he lives about four miles from the place of his birth, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, so deeply rooted and deeply cares about San Francisco. So welcome, Joe. Thank you. And on that note, the floor is yours. Well, thank you kindly. Uh, let me uh, put whomever can answer the question on the spot. I hadn't planned on ads starting this way, but it seems we're having a spate of violent crimes. Uh, I, I would guess that uh, Chief Bill Scott is the natural person to answer this, but can you tell me a little bit about what's going on right now? We've either had uh, two and two days of homicides or three and three days, uh, if my intelligence is good. Uh, what can you tell us, uh, Chief Scott? Hey, Joe. Um, uh, thanks for that question and starting out with that question because violent crimes is always gonna be you know, one of our priorities. So in the last couple of days, we have had uh, a slew of homicides, as you put it there. Um, if, from what we know right now, these were homicides that were uh, involving personal disputes that ended up with gun violence. And in each occasion, at least two of the three, actually two of the three, three occasions for sure. And the third one, there's a possibility of that, but two of them for sure, um, we have you know, evidence that these were personal disputes between the individuals involved and it ended up being gun violence. You know, we are investigating these cases. There are all open investigations. We do have some good leads and 
hopefully we'll have enough evidence to make an arrest and present a solid case to uh, District Attorney Bodine and his staff. And we're gonna work as hard as we can to do that. No we're arrest yet? I'm sorry, no arrest yet. Mm -hmm. no, no arrest yet, but we do have some very good solid leads and I'm, I'm hoping uh, that we have arrests in the very near future on, on uh, at least two of these cases. On one, I think it's gonna take more work. Well, Joe, if I could just add on to that briefly, um, as Chief Scott said, violent crime, homicides in particular are a high priority. Really, there is no more serious category of crime. And it's an area where both Chief Scott and I dedicate our most experienced and um, you know, staff members that we have the most confidence in. And it, and it pays off. Um, Chief Scott's team saw very close to every one of the homicides that occurred in San Francisco last year. They had one of the best clearance rates. Uh, anywhere you look in any major city in the country for homicides in 2020. And that's something that I think they deserve a lot of credit for and something that they should be proud of. Um, it, by the same token, once they do make arrests and present us with evidence and cases that give us enough evidence to prosecute, we do. And I, I'm confident that in these cases, the police will investigate thoroughly, will make arrests, and that will give us information that allows us to hold the people that committed these crimes accountable. We've done that recently. Just in the last month, we secured two guilty verdicts and two separate murder cases in front of San Francisco juries. Couldn't have done that without police department investigation and testimony, and couldn't have done it without the hard work of the lawyers in my homicide unit either. Well, this is a tough task for both of you. A tough task for both of you here because I think that people in San Francisco seem to have little patience separating the crimes that are on their mind with the crime trends. So explain to me, uh, Separate and apart from these three homicides in three days, which is quite notable, what is the state of public safety and crime in San Francisco right now in summer of, uh, or rather past summer of 21? And, and that's for both of you. Yeah, uh, Joe, who, who would you like to go first on that? Either, why don't you go first, uh, uh, Chief Scott? Okay, sure. Well, I, let, me, let me start by, by this, because I know I, even I see one of the comments in the chat with um, one of our, our audience members who's experiencing an increase in crime in their community. So let's start with the reality that, you know, people who are victimized by crime, whether it's reported or not, that crime is very real. And that becomes, you know, a lot of what their experiences and their, their, their take on things is driven by. And that's a real uh, thing for us that we have to address. Now, in terms of the statistical data, sometimes it's not always true to what actually happens in our community. For instance, there are some crimes that people don't report. You know, uh, car break-ins, for example. We know that not everybody reports when their car gets broken into. People don't always report robberies. And believe it or not, people don't always report when they're shot. But we do the best we can based on what's reported to us. You know, and, and with that said, there's a couple of things for this year uh, in, in terms of how we are tracking. We're up significantly in some areas like shootings. We are up almost triple digits. You know, it's over 90% in our victims of gun violence being hit by gunshots. Homicides, we were close to where we were this time last year. I think with the last couple of days events, now we, we're, we exceed where we were this time last year. Um, other areas were down. We're down significantly in robberies, about 10% down in robberies overall. Again, noting that not all crimes get reported. Actually, actually in, in, in the area of retail theft, uh, in terms of how it's categorized in our systems, we're down over the, this year. So there are areas that we're up, we're ticking up in car breaking and it's going up significantly, but we've made some significant arrests and the prosecutors, the DA's office, uh, with their help, these cases have been prosecuted. And oftentimes when we arrest who we think are the prolific people, we see immediate uh, slowing down and in, in those particular categories of crime that they're involved in. So we're kind of, when we look at this year from last year, we're up in some areas and we're down in some areas. When we look at this over time, we actually aren't faring as bad as a lot of people might think. But again, I wanna put this, uh, make sure I'm clear on this. It's not to discount what people are seeing and feeling in their communities, because we know not all crime is reported. But the, the you know, our statistics are our, they are what they are, and we can only go by what we get reported and what we hear and what we see. So we've done a, an analysis of the last five years, and that was made public just to show people what this looks like over time. Nothing more, nothing less. 
And it gives people a perspective of what we look like over time. And when you look at where we are over time, actually, you know, crime is, it has been reduced, at least reported crime anyway. Uh, Mr. Boudin? I just want to echo what Chief Scott said. You know, there's a sometimes a bit of a disconnect between um, what the data shows us and what we have to be guided by when we make policies and what people feel in their day-to-day -day lives. And there is nothing more important for me and for my office than to ensure that everybody in San Francisco is safe and that they also feel safe. And those things are not always uh, um, in lockstep. You know, the data, as the chief and the mayor have pointed out um, recently, show that overall crime is down. And that's two years in a row. Crime is down in 2021 compared to 2020. And crime was down by double digits in many categories, not all, in 2020 compared to 2019. If you look at overall violent crime or overall nonviolent crime in 2021, year to date, and you compare it to last year or the year before, it's actually down. It's down compared to 2019. It's down compared to 2018. Now, that's a good thing, but it doesn't mean that everybody feels safe. And we're, we're going to continue working tirelessly until everybody is safe and feels safe. So what might explain some of that disconnect? Why is it that if crime is down in terms of the statistics, people might not feel safe or as safe as they might have felt in the past? Well, as Chief Scott said, not all crime gets reported. That's not a new problem. It was true in 2018. It was true in 2019. It was true in 2020. But it may be that people are reporting crime less. That's certainly something. Yeah, way to measure that. Is there a time when crime stats were good? Because one of the major uh, methods used when, when people are told, hey, statistically, this is what the crime rate is. They say, I don't trust statistics. Right. People don't report crimes. But as you said, was there a time that we can go back and say, these are better stats? The, the truth is there's only you know, one or two categories of crime where we can be really confident that we always have good data. And that's homicides and, and maybe to a lesser extent, shootings. We know with homicides because tragically there's a dead body and it ends up in the hospital or it ends up in the morgue uh, and we find out about it. Uh, when it comes to shootings, because the city of San Francisco has a system called Shot Spotter that allows police to be notified pretty much in real time, anytime a firearm is discharged within the 49 square miles of the city, we know when there's a firearm discharge. Um, so we can see firearm discharges that don't get reported. We can get a sense of you know, what percentage of them don't get reported. Um, police will then, you know, in many instances, find shell casings, look for witnesses or, or, or surveillance footage. When it comes to other categories of crime, things like shoplifting, for example, if a chain, you know, Target or Walgreens or, or The Gap or any one of these major chains that has numerous stores throughout the city has a change in policy, for example, if they tell their employees to stop calling the police for certain categories of crime, there's no way we can know about that. And I want to be clear on the sequence of events that has to occur in order for the system to hold people accountable. When someone commits a crime, the police have to find out about it. Someone has to call them. They have to be alerted, whether it's shot spotter or a 911 phone call. Once the police are alerted, they have to investigate. They have to solve the case. They have to figure out who did what and bring my office evidence. Sometimes that happens immediately. Other times, as Chief Scott said in one of the recent homicides, it may take a little while. It may take a while for them to follow leads, get witness cooperation, track down video footage, perhaps get DNA evidence. Once they make an arrest and present a case to my office, that's when we get involved. That's when we formally get notified. That's when we make a decision about whether we have enough evidence to file criminal charges, whether we need further investigation or something in the middle. Um, but if people aren't doing that first step of notifying the police, there is no way they can go out and do their job, and there's no way I can do mine. Chief Scott, well, there's a third way. There is a third way, and this is only semi-facetiously. Do you need to have the crime caught made into a viral video in order to get it solved? It seems that those cases get solved very quickly. And, and this is, I guess, I guess, okay, it's first a question for you, uh, Chief Scott. Is it a legitimate complaint that day-to-day -day crime is not given the attention that it should be by the San Francisco Police Department, that uh, it has to be made into an embarrassing spectacle that, uh, that shows the city in disrepute before uh, the full force of the San Francisco Police Department comes in because those cases get solved. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, I, th I think that's an inaccurate ass assessment. I think I know because, but you know, here's the reality. It, there are very few of those viral videos in a big scheme of things. And we investigate thousands of crimes every, tens of thousands of crimes every year. 
And when we have the evidence, we're going to follow up on that evidence. And every day I get one at flyers that come through my desk about people that our investigators have identified through video or whatever the evidence is. And, and those cases get presented to the prosecutors. And, 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 and many, in most occasions, those cases are filed on if we give them the evidence. So I, you know, the, the notion that only those cases that go viral are, are given that attention is, is really an inaccuracy. And, and I will tell you this, yeah, um, yeah, I'm glad that we are able to save some of those viral cases or, or not save the cases, but solve the cases. But we don't solve all of them because sometimes the evidence is just not there. And you know, we would like to solve all of them, but we're gonna give these cases our attention. What we really go by is, do we have evidence to follow up on? You know, a lot of our crimes that we do get reported, like car break-ins, you wake up in the morning, there's a pile of glass in the street, there's nothing to follow up on. But if we get a, a video, whether it's viral or not, with a, you know, the face of a person who committed the crime, we have good success with a lot of those cases. And particularly in our neighborhoods where we have officers out on the beats, they know the community, uh, we've gotten good success. I mean, look, nobody really made a big deal out of that. One of these cases, the Walgreens case, and we made an arrest on, and I think the DA can correct me, I think I'm correct on this. That person was followed on and is still in custody. You know, nobody really made a big deal about that. That's right, Chief. And, and, and so we, we, we need to kind of, you know, lift these cases up when they do get solved because they are worthy of attention, but we pay attention to cases when we have the evidence to do it. And we definitely pursue evidence, you know, we, not on every case, so sometimes there's just not anything to go by, but those cases that have evidence, we're going to pursue them. You know, I just want to emphasize one of the points uh, Chief Scott just made, if I could, for a minute there, Joe. You know, there's a lot of focus on these viral videos, and I understand that's why they're viral. People are watching them all over the world. People are seeing them. They're, they're trying to learn lessons from these videos. They're trying to act as though those videos represent what's happening day in, day out. They represent the outlier, the exception. That's why they go viral, because they're so outlandish. The norm... The most common scenario is when police make an arrest, we prosecute and we hold people accountable. That's what happens in the majority of cases the police bring us. In that Walgreens case, that, that video, I think, was seen by six or seven million people. As Chief Scott said, they did the follow-up work. They worked in partnership with the loss prevention team at Walgreens, the company called Alto. They found the suspect. They brought him to us with solid evidence. And we filed uh, more than a dozen separate criminal charges against him and asked for the court to hold him in custody. There wasn't any reporting on that. There wasn't any news coverage following up. Alto had to do an op-ed in a Chronicle to tell people, hey, pay attention to what happened after the video. Pay attention to the cooperation between the private sector, the police department, the district attorney's office. The two homicide cases, the two murders that resulted in guilty verdicts in front of San Francisco juries in the last couple of weeks, there wasn't any press coverage of that. There's no coverage of what happens after the police get the case and dig in and, and follow leads and chase down evidence and present the case to us and we file charges. Folks are sadly in social media, next door, Twitter, focused on these viral videos that are scary without doing the work to see what happens down the line and letting the system, the justice system wheels turn to a fair and just outcome based on the evidence. Let me ask a question. Uh, Chief Scott, it seems that rather than an example of what was going wrong, we could say that the Walgreens case is a case where things went right. The, the man was caught on video. He was apprehended. He was charged with, I believe, 15 counts. He is no longer out, able to do this. Uh, this is a situation you inherited from your, from, from your predecessors, but the, uh, the arrest and clearance rate for, San, for the San Francisco Police Department is, is low. I believe there was a, a Public Policy Institute of California study uh, from two years ago that put San Francisco at 58 out of the 58 counties at arrest rate. What are you doing to bring this up? And what opportunities even for, for someone who's tough on crime or liberal on crime are being missed by not making these interventions? Yeah, so let me, let me start with um, the first question you asked about the, I think you asked, the, did you ask about the clearance rate first or the arrest rate? Uh, whichever one is, is top of mind, but, but you know, uh, it was the PPIC study was about uh, the arrest rate. Okay. Yeah. So the, the arrest rates really are dependent on the categories of crime. You know, our biggest driver of our statistics in this city is property crime. And, you know, theft is the biggest driver. Now, in theft, there's several categories. We have, you know, we have car break-ins, we have burglaries, we have uh, 
um, shoplift type of, of thefts. And then we have just plain theft, you know, somebody stole my, my potted plant off of my, my, my front stoop, that, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. the, the clearance rates are traditionally low in, in those general theft areas. Some of them are higher than others. I can tell you for car burglaries, it, any city that's doing 10% is doing extremely well as far mm -hmm. as the arrest rate and clearance rate. When you think about it, we get 20 plus thousand car, cars broken into uh, in a year. Um, and I, you know, this is something that I've been tracking a long time and I used to be an investigator. If you're doing 10% with car burglaries as far, as far as your arrest rates in a major city, you're doing phenomenally well. Usually that number is around 4%. Uh, burglaries is usually a, a bit higher. 30% is exceptional. The national clearance rate average for property crime is about a little less than 30%. And this has been tried a year in and year out for a long time. Some cities do a little bit better. Some cities do a little bit worse. Uh, we're right in that ballpark. Now, when we talk about violent crimes, which is a much smaller number in terms of the overall scheme of statistics, homicides, robberies, assaults. Homicides is usually a, a much lower number, and this city has a really good arrest and clearance rate for homicides, as you know the DA pointed out earlier. Um, and for the last several years, we've been you know upwards of eighty percent, which is actually really really good. Assaults is, is generally less than that. You know we saw fifty percent of our assaults. That's uh, that's usually respectable among the national scheme of things. And then robberies is usually somewhere nationally around thirty percent. And we're usually somewhere in there, in that ballpark, sometimes lower, sometimes we've been higher. Our robbery uh, clearance rates actually have been going up. Um, and there's some challenges with COVID and everybody's wearing masks these days. So it's hard to, to make who people are, even when they're on video. And we have to overcome those challenges. But the point to all of this is, yes, one of the reasons that if this makes sense to the audience and those that are listening, property crimes are traditionally harder to solve. You know, a way outside of burglaries, which a lot of times you have forensic evidence, fingerprints and DNA and those types of things, but they're generally harder to solve. And, and nationally, if you look at the UCR statistics nationally, it's going to be a much lower arrest rate for property crime. Now, San Francisco is a property crime driven city. It's been that way for a long time. So we're generally going to be at the lower end of, the, of that spectrum. Now, with that said, we want to do better. You know, as far as getting the evidence to the DA, as far as forensic evidence, we had a campaign about two years ago where we really were encouraging the public to get their their, their vehicles when they were broken into fingerprinted. That was met, met with some mixed results. We didn't get a whole lot of traction on that. But I will encourage anybody that's listening, please report the crime. I know sometimes it's inconvenient. Report it so we know what's happening. Um, if you can bring your, your car or if your house is burglarized, allow us to print it. Um, and we then at least have a chance to gather evidence that's usable, particularly if we find prints on the inside of a car. And we have made cases and the DA has filed cases, uh, one just recently, where we found blood that because the suspect was, was cut as he broke into a car, we got DNA from that. And that was one that we, we were able to solve because of evidence. So I know that was a long explanation, um, we will continue to try to do better in terms of raising those rates up, arrest rates. Property crimes are generally generally harder to solve. I'm very pleased with how, what we do on homicides, and we actually want to do a better job of shootings as well, non-fatal shootings, mm -hmm. because that, that rate, we believe, we can improve some. But the bottom line, Joe, is we're going to continue to work to get better at this. Well, I don't want to discount the, what you said about violent crimes, specifically homicides and shootings, and I don't want to make comparisons between burglaries and, uh, and robberies and, and homicides. And um, so, so, so certainly I don't want to do that. But with, with auto burglaries, and this predates um, your hiring, uh, the, the arrest rate has hovered below 2%. And with uh, burglaries, I think the clearance now is, is not quite 10%. So what I'm wondering is, is there anything specific about San Francisco that makes it hard to make those crimes? Or is this just an area for improvement with the San Francisco Police Department? Well, I think it's an area for improvement. Look, I mean, every, every community has its, its characteristics. Um, it's an area for improvement. I mean, I, you know, we, we need people to report. We need people to allow us to come in and do prints and those type of things. Um, but it's an area for improvement all the way around. And I don't you know, offer any that this is a San Francisco thing. You know, I've 
police in another city. It was difficult there too. There's room for improvement. And I, and I will say that, and we've identified some areas where we believe we can improve. Um, and part of it is, is putting more resources to those types of crimes. You know, we just, we're in the process of standing up a, a retail theft unit because the, uh, the investigators that we have, they do a fairly good job, but they're overwhelmed. There's not enough of them. Uh, two years ago, we stood up a burglary unit uh, and for that very reason, because a lot of these crimes are cross-jurisdictional, uh, across district boundaries within the city and across city boundaries and county boundaries. So what we found, one of the areas of improvement is we weren't doing a good enough job tying these crimes together when they're regional. And that's what this citywide unit now does. And they've done a fairly good job. We need more of them. And, you know, you heard me screaming for resources uh, in this budget cycle, and I'll, I'll continue to do that. And the DA has as well. But Joe, the reality is we do need the resources to do this work. You know, we, we have to have the personnel to, to add the number of investigators to do the work. I just had a meeting with some of our property crime investigators. The one thing I heard consistently is we need more help. So, you know, we've asked for overtime to do that. We're bringing you know, some retired investigators at least to help with the administrative functions, not to actually investigate the crimes, but some of the administrative paperwork that needs to be done. Um, and I hear them. We need more help. And we, you know, we, we only have what we have, though. And Joe, I want to just I want to just make sure, Joe, that people in the in the audience understand what we're talking about as we talk about clearance rates. Um, when when a crime does get reported to the police, they they investigate, and if they determine that no crime was committed, or if they solve the crime, meaning they identify the person they believe committed it, make an arrest, and present it to my office, it goes in their clearance rate category. So that's at a very high level what we mean when we're talking about a, a case getting cleared. It means the police investigating that case to conclusion um, and either presenting it for prosecution or closing it because there's no arrest that's warranted based on all the information. Uh, that's what we're talking about, folks, when we talk about clearance rate. And I, and I do want to just emphasize, um, you know, Chief Scott mentioned resources. Um, my office had the lowest uh, budget with regard to the number of full-time employees in 2020, 2021 fiscal year that we've had for any time in the last five or six years. We had fewer attorneys and paralegals and investigators in our budget in my first full fiscal year in office than at any point in recent history. That affects things, just like court closures and masks and COVID-19 affect things. It is not only our personal lives and, and professional lives that are impacted by COVID-19, it's the justice system. Sadly, it's been harder for police to make arrests. It's been uh, scarier for people who are on the streets when we don't have tourists and bustling commercial districts, people commuting to and from work. You know, in a normal pre-COVID era, we'd be doing this event with all 200 and however many participants in person. We'd be in a, in a, in a big place. And afterwards, people would go for dinner or they'd go for drinks or they'd walk home, they'd bike around the city. Right now, we're all doing this from the privacy of our homes or, or our, our offices in a way that leads all of us to feel less safe when we are out and about on the streets. There's fewer people. And the people who are there are more likely to be people who are unhoused, who don't have the opportunity to do an event like this from the privacy of their home. That makes people feel less safe, even if there's not more crime being committed. Because what we see on the streets may be more mental illness or more substance abuse or more uh, tents set up. That perception, especially when we don't have tourists coming to the city, especially when we have budget cuts in pretty much every major city department all at once, that makes people feel less safe. You have a cordial relationship with Chief Scott, uh, but you have complained that they're not making adequate arrests. You have complained that, that you're not getting enough cases to prosecute to, to make a dent, specifically when people blame your office for the ills of this city. What more could they do? Uh, what You seem to have a good relationship with Chief Scott. Uh, you must talk about this. I have tremendous respect for Chief Scott and for the men and women in his department. The people in the police department wearing uniforms in San Francisco are doing a hard and sometimes an impossible job. They're doing it every day. They're doing it under conditions that have never been more challenging for any of us. So when we talk about clearance rates, yes, Chief Scott and I talk about that. I know for certain that I'd like to see his clearance rates go up. And he just told all of you he'd like to see it too. It's an area for improvement. I also know by the same token that he'd like to see uh, the effectiveness with which my staff and my office holds people they do arrest accountable go up, right? And that means different things depending on the case. But every one of us is frustrated when someone that they've arrested goes out and commits another crime. 
whether it's because we don't have enough evidence to prosecute or because they're released from custody or because securing a criminal conviction against them doesn't break the cycle of recidivism. So there are real frustrations that are not unique to me or Chief Scott that are not limited to San Francisco. Let's take a step back and look at the realities of the American approach to criminal justice. In the state of California, more than two thirds of people being released from state prison are gonna be rearrested and reincarcerated within a couple of years. That's not Chief Scott's fault. That's not my fault. That's not a superior court judge in San Francisco's fault. That's what happens when we send them to prison. After years of incarceration, the majority of people will be rearrested and reincarcerated. We need new approaches. We need better approaches. And that's why we've been working hard in San Francisco to lead the way on alternatives to incarceration that get at root causes of crime, to hold people accountable in ways that do more than just warehouse them for an arbitrary number of days, weeks, months, or years. We have tremendous success with some of those programs. Our drug court, our young adult court, those programs, our behavioral health court, mental health diversion, are actually providing case management and treatment to people whose crime is based on a life of either poverty, addiction, mental illness, or other root causes that we know we can address more effectively with care, not with cages. Hold that thought, but let me ask you a question here. Uh, specifically, uh, District Attorney Boudin, what would you say to the critics charged that you still have a public defender's mentality, even though you are now the district attorney? It's a good quip. It's simply not supported by the facts. We filed over 7,000 new criminal charges, uh, new criminal cases since I took office. We filed at a pace that is as high or higher than this administration under, under excuse me, than this office under prior administrations. So, uh, you know, people can say that all they want. It sounds nice, but the data simply doesn't support it. Now, specifically, uh, pushing back just a little bit, in the case with Robert Newt with the guns, uh, you had uh, pushed for more DNA evidence on the guns that were discovered in this man who was alone with the guns in the car. Um, he was uh, uh, on probation. He shouldn't have had a gun, et cetera. Um, without the DNA evidence, uh, he, he went on and, and uh, I believe he's suspected of a double murder. My question is, why not go with the case that you had? Did you need DNA evidence in this case where there's a prohibited felon in a car with a gun and a car that was tied to other shootings? So, I mean, this is the kind of thing that, that your critics whom, whom you have rebutted here would say, see, this is a case where he could have built the case he had without the DNA evidence. Yeah, that, that, that's simply not true, and it misses the big picture here. Um, it's also not a decision that I personally made. The lawyer in my office who made that decision has been a prosecutor in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office for well over 20 years. He knows what a provable case is in front of a San Francisco jury. He knows what one isn't. And in that case, he looked at the evidence. We had a witness identification that pointed to someone of a different race than Mr. Newt. We had a car that wasn't registered to Mr. Newt. We had a situation in which there was no other direct connection between him and the gun other than that it was found in a car, not under his waistband, not under his seat, in a separate part of the vehicle. And the reality is without DNA evidence, a case like that, we cannot secure a criminal conviction. He was not on probation. He'd never been convicted of a crime in San Francisco County. And so looking at someone stopped in a car that does not match the description uh, that the police were looking for, that has no other connection to the gun, yeah, we do need DNA. And we asked for it. And tragically, before the crime lab was able to get it to us, he committed, we believe, we accused him of and prosecuting him for committing two murders. Uh, that's the reality of our system. We have to do investigation. We depend on police to do DNA tests, and they do them really quickly, not always quick enough. But the fact is, that case could not have been proven, would not have even made it in front of a jury, would have been dismissed by a judge at a preliminary hearing without DNA evidence. And in order to protect the integrity of that case, in order to ensure that when we did file it, we were able to move forward effectively and competently, we did what that prosecutor in my office has done for every one of the 20 years he's been in the office. He asked the police for the evidence that he knew was necessary to avoid having the case dismissed. And Chief Scott, uh, putting you on the spot a bit, do you agree with this assessment? And uh, Mr. Boudin has big plans to change criminal justice. And I think, you know, has that made life harder for the police to make cases or is that a misnomer? Oh, look, the, the, let me start with this. The criminal justice system is changing, period. And uh, the DA has brought some changes. And some of these changes, you know, we have had, I don't agree with everything, but I, I, I will say this. Our, our job and our mission when the DA's policies, whatever they are, is to work with the district attorney. 
And we have a good enough relationship where we talk these things through. And sometimes, you know, it's give and take. Uh, sometimes it becomes more difficult. But that's overall change in general. I mean, look, I, it, you know, 32 years in this business, it's not the first time that we've worked through a change in criminal justice system. You know, a few years ago when, when the laws change on uh, probation and parole status, and not status, but uh, how, how people were either um, uh, supervised by probation or county parole, that was that was transformative with our with our criminal justice system, uh, the, the the laws on property crimes and things like that. What we have to do, Joe, is adapt. And as a chief of police, my job is to work with changes in the law, changes with the district attorney's policies, and adapt to make sure that we provide the things that we need to provide for everybody to to do what they need to do. And, and so. Uh, to answer your question, change is difficult, period, not because of uh, the DA's policies, but we have to adapt to change. And we don't always agree, but there are many things that we do agree on. And the thing is, you know, my role in, in, in this seat that I'm sitting in uh, is to get the job done, to adapt to the change, whatever that change might be, so we can serve the, the communities that we are being paid to serve. And that does not include, you know, arguing with the DA's policies if I disagree with them. What it is is, hey, let's talk about it. I'll give you my point of view, but we're going to do everything we can to work toward getting you what you need to do what you need to do because we depend on each other. His office depends on my office. My office depends on his office, and the community depends on us both, and they depend on us to work together. That's our best course of action. Yeah, I'm sure he doesn't agree with all my decisions. But we talk about them and we try to make the best of those conversations and we move forward. That's what it takes to really facilitate change because the bigger issue is this. The public is demanding change in the system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, overall, the public is demanding change in our criminal justice system. So that doesn't happen without a little bit of pain, a little bit of sacrifice, a little bit of disagreement, a little bit of different point of view and perspective. But in all that, we got to do the job that we, we're getting paid to do. And that is to work together. So that's what we're trying to do, and that's what we'll continue to do. And, and Joe, I just want to echo a couple of things that Chief said and make clear for folks. You know, we have different roles in the system, and we depend really heavily on each other and on working together to do our roles. The police in the field have a lower standard before they make an arrest than my lawyers have before we charge a case that we think we can secure a conviction in. That's how the system's set up. It's supposed to be that way. They don't have all the information. They're not people who went to law school for the most part. Some of them are, but the, the, the point is there's a different legal standard before an arrest and before a, a criminal charge can be filed or result in a conviction. That's the system. And if you look at, you know, you talked about policies, Joe, and, and as Chief Scott said, we may not agree with each other on 100% of issues, but what we do agree on is we need to work together to make San Francisco safer. And that's something that we will never waver on. Neither one of us, that's our, our mission. That's our focus for each of us and for the departments that we lead. You talked about policies. Whether or not we charge a particular case, like the Newt case, has nothing to do with my policies. It has everything to do with the evidence we believe we need to secure a criminal conviction. And if you look at the rate at which my staff, my administration is asking the police to do more investigation in cases like the Robert Newt case, it's consistent with prior years. That's not a policy change. That's a reflection of what juries expect. San Francisco juries, they hold us to a high standard. San Francisco voters, they demand the best. They want to see things like video evidence. They want to see forensic evidence, DNA evidence. And if we don't have it in a case like that one, we're not going to get a conviction. So we go to the police, we let them know what we think we need, and we work together to hold those who commit a crime accountable. We do it all day, every day. Chief Scott, can you have a symbiotic, positive, professional relationship with, with, uh, with Chase Boudin and maintain the support of the rank and file San Francisco Police Department, or, or, is, or is that not possible right now? Oh, I think it's possible, uh, and, and here, here's why. Like, I, I have maintained a good relationship with, with our public defender. Uh, I, they don't always agree with us. We don't always agree with them. They hold us accountable. They, they raise issues all the time. I hold uh, good relationships with this DA, with the prior DA. And what I try to keep our folks focused on is not getting caught up in the, you know, the emotion of the moment or whatever the issue might be, is what's the right thing to do? 
what's the right thing to do for this department, for this city? And the right thing to do is to do our jobs, to work with our, our district attorney, to, to do the things that we need to do to give them what they need to prosecute the case, if it's there. And I, you know, I, I, I have not wavered from that. I came in the door, uh, even with uh, the DA's predecessor, with, with uh, DA Gascon, there was, there was some, you know, some fight there as well. But you, you have never heard me talk about or, or, or disparage the, uh, our, our district attorney, not this one, not his predecessor, and you will never hear, because that's not what I should be doing as police chief. I can call out issues. I can say I don't agree. Uh, but I'll do it in respectfully. And sometimes that needs to be behind closed doors. I mean, it, it, you know, the public, I think, expects us to work together uh, as best we can. I'm not saying the public expects us to agree on every issue, but they expect us to work together. And, and if I didn't have this uniform on and I were, you know, not sitting in a seat, that's what I would expect. So, yeah, I think it can be done. Uh, not everybody's going to agree with that. But here, here's, here's the bottom line. Um, you know, I, I've been a patrol officer, I've been an investigator, I've been in virtually every rank in, in policing. And when you're sitting in that seat, you don't always have the insight of what's needed at the executive level. You know, you know your job, you know your role and all that. And I, I know there was a time where, you know, I made some assessments probably about the way I thought things should be. And once I got to a level where I really understood the full picture, it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe I didn't, I wasn't as thoughtful as I should have been back in my younger years when I thought I knew what I really didn't know. So what I, what I say to that, Joe, is this. Everybody has an opinion. I hear, I hear folks, we have discussions internally about what the right thing to do is. Sometimes people don't agree internally with that. Um, but we got to keep moving forward and we have to do our jobs and we have to really, our, our loyalty is, should be to public safety. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, once again, I wasn't, I wasn't doubting your relationship and your synergy, but, but, you know, certainly the, the police officers association and, and the, uh, and the general body, and even those who ever mans the Twitter account have, have very vociferous opinions, but we'll get to that. Um, I am going to give way momentarily to, uh, I see more than a hundred questions lined up and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, this is not a board of supervisors meeting, so so we're not going to get to all of them. But uh, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Boudin, um, let me make this a little bit unwieldy to, to combine two questions because we're hurrying. But uh, you and I talked quite a bit after the Troy McAllister situation, and uh, and I assume we have a high level of listeners here, so I don't have to recapitulate everything. But but this was a man who was referred repeatedly to parole, and and parole didn't didn't do everything perhaps it could have. I'm wondering what lessons you learn and if there are any specific policy changes that you made and the lessons in general that you've taken in this regard to policy. And then let me combine this question asking, how has the job been compared to your expectations as far as managing versus policy? You manage a big office with a big budget. It's a, a hard job. You've never been a manager before. So talk to me about the policies that you have, the, what you've learned with regard to policies, and also how the job has come at you with the management policy uh, uh, split uh, and how that, how, that, how that looks compared to what you were expecting. Absolutely, well, you know, Joe, the, the, the reality is with the Troy McAllister case and with any case where someone who's caught up in the criminal justice system goes on to commit a serious crime, especially a fatal crime, um, we all lay awake at night wondering what we could have done differently. Those are the kinds of tragedies that make every one of us and every agency that touch that person, whether it be the parole department, the police department, the sheriff's department, the, 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 I'm sure even the public defenders are asking questions about what went wrong, what they could have done to it. Nobody wants to see that happen. And certainly not me and anybody in my office. So yeah, we learn lessons and we change policies. And I know that every single other agency involved in Troy McAllister's case wishes that they had done something different. I'm not gonna call out other agencies. I'm not gonna talk about mistakes they made or policies that they change without notifying their partners. Let me tell you what we learned and what we've done differently since that case. I learned as a result of that case that starting in 2013, remember Chief Scott a few moments ago mentioned big changes years ago and how parole was handled? Well, back in um, what they called realignment, um, they shifted local, um, they shifted 
parole from state prison, from the CDCR to local probation departments in most cases. And along with that realignment process of having creating essentially what they call county prison instead of state prison, uh, the State Department of Parole asked district attorneys all across the state to stop filing their own parole revocations. In other words, to let parole make the decision about whether to revoke somebody or not. Now, that was a change that was requested by the Department of Corrections way before I was district attorney, years before. And it was a change that was respected, a request that was requested, that was respected by the San Francisco District Attorney's Office and by most offices across the state. In other words, district attorneys stopped filing parole revocations. We simply referred parole violations to the Department of Parole. If we weren't going to file our own case or if there wasn't enough evidence, we let them intervene as they saw fit. Well, that didn't work, obviously, for lots of reasons we could talk about and unpack. But what that means is now, going forward, since Troy McAllister, we do file parole revocations ourselves, even though the state prison, Department of Corrections, parole division does not want us to do it. We're doing it because we clearly need to take responsibility for parolees who are arrested in San Francisco, whether we can file a new criminal charge or not. And so I have a lawyer in my intake team who looks at those cases, who communicates with parole and everyone learns what he can from the parole agent and then makes a decision about whether we're gonna file a parole revocation or not. That's a critical change. It's a critical change that gives us more direct local control over people who've been released from prison and are on active parole supervision. Now, to your second question, Joe, about the balance between management and policy, uh, there's really three separate parts of the job. Those are two of them. Um, but I think, you know, more than whether or not it's been a steep learning curve in terms of managing an office of 300 people, the bigger learning curve has been trying to learn to manage and lead and make policy in the context of COVID-19. I'd never heard of Zoom when I took office. I never imagined what it would look like to try and conduct a jury trial with witnesses wearing face masks. And so, yeah, there have been challenges. There's been a learning curve. Absolutely. I've been lucky to have an amazing staff in my office, people who've been doing this work for years, people who've joined our ranks, who are eager and hardworking and energetic and passionate about public safety. The biggest challenge by far has not been management or working with Chief Scott. As you can tell, he's wonderful to work with. The biggest challenge has been figuring out how to keep the wheels of justice turning when our courtrooms are closed, when everybody's wearing a mask, when the court will not allow us to convene grand juries for months on end, when the basic functioning of our system is gummed up by medical advice and scientific requirements that we not be in close proximity to each other. At this point, I, I do have more questions, but I'm going to, uh, to give up to the, uh, to the floor. Uh, I think Nick, you come back in here. Um, we have a lot to choose from. We do. Um, where to begin here? Uh, one that one question that's been popping up a lot, and I think this is for uh, for both of you here. Um, there's, you know, there's this feeling that we're not holding uh, people who commit crimes for things like you know garage theft, car break-ins, package theft. Uh, that we're not holding them accountable for various reasons. Um, a lot of people saying this is the worst they've ever seen in their life. You know, again, this talk about not feeling safe. Um, what would, how would you respond to that? that? There is this feeling, this strong sentiment, overwhelming um, from these questions. How would, you, how would you respond to that, this feeling of lack of safety and people not being held accountable? Well, let, me, let me be real clear. When police, police make arrests and bring us evidence in cases, we take steps to hold people accountable. We do it in the majority of cases. We do it at rates that are higher than in years before I took office. Those are the facts. Now, is it true that it takes a long time from us filing charges to a conviction being secured or a case being resolved? Absolutely. When I took office, I inherited over 5,000 open criminal cases on day one. And those cases, 20% of them were more than two years old. The wheels of justice turned slow before COVID-19, and it has only make us, made us slower to have many of our courtrooms shut down, to have the courts say we're not going to bring juries in, or we're not going to bring juries into most of our courtrooms because we can't risk having that many people in the Hall of Justice. It's been a frustration to all of us. I know it's been a frustration for Chief Scott and for the, the, the people wearing his uniforms every day. They do investigations, they make arrests, we file charges, and then they wait for sometimes years before they get called in to testify in front of a jury about what happened. 
But make no mistake, when police bring us cases, we are filing charges and taking steps to hold people accountable. Let me give you a couple examples of statistics. This year, so far in 2021, when police bring us an arrest in a burglary case, we're filing charges in over 80% of the cases. When police bring us arrests in a robbery case, this year we're filing charges in over 70% of the cases. So the reality is when they do what they're doing every day, investigating, making arrests, bringing us cases, we take the next step in the wheel. We keep the wheel moving. And we, if you follow the cases, it's court is open. Come watch what's happening in criminal court any day of the week. You will see thousands of cases moving through the court system, everything from petty theft all the way up to murder, where police did their job and we're doing ours. And if I could add uh, to the district attorney's comments, I, here, here's some things that I think we are doing well. I mean, some, some of our offenders, particularly the ones that are uh, um, have heavy criminal justice histories, I think we're working well together, his team and my team and our team, on tracking these individuals. And we communicate uh, particularly with property crime burglaries in particular. And many of the people that are the most prolific, once we have arrested them, and this is particularly this year, um, because we're tracking, because we're paying attention, and because his, his district attorneys are asking for detentions on these cases, many of these, these uh, individuals are, are being detained until their cases are heard. Now, ultimately, that's going to be up to the courts of how long they are detained, but I think that's uh, a collaborative improvement between our two offices that we are both focusing on. And I, I think we're seeing some, some good results because when we know we have a prol prolific person and they are detained rather than being let out on, on either, you know, bail is pretty much a thing of the past, but uh, released on their own recognizance, those detentions sometimes we're able to slow the rate of crime down. And, and we know that to be the case. So I think that's something that we are doing uh, better at. And definitely, we always are looking for ways to, to get better. The, the other thing I want to point out is this. A lot of you know what we respond to, and this is kind of going to the, what Joe asked earlier about change in the criminal justice system. Now, the will of the people is, is very strong. And when laws change uh, in terms of incarceration and, and the levels of for instance, petty theft to, 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 to uh, grand theft, the laws changed and that threshold was, was raised. That was the will of the voters. We, we have to react to that and we have to abide by what the will of the voters was. I mean, you know, just a few years ago, this state was facing terrible prison overcrowding and the governor had to make some decisions and, you know, people were released that may not have been released in the past, but those changes are changes that we have to adapt to and figure out ways efficient, fair, procedurally just ways to deal with those changes. Um, those are rules that not, nobody, on, at least, you know, in our positions may, but we have to react to those. And what I, to, to Joe's question, I think, uh, Nick, to your question, I think this is part of what we're seeing now. We're in the process of trying to figure out, okay, what is our strategies to deal with some of these changes in the last five, eight years in the law? because I don't think we've adapted as quickly as we need to to address some of these issues. I know we're all working hard to do that, but there are some success stories that we can talk about where I know collaboration has paid dividends and you know at least holding some of these folks accountable until they get to trial. Mm -hmm. I want to give you one example of that collaboration real quick, if I could, Joe. You know, uh, this issue that uh, Chief Scott mentioned of some individuals being responsible for uh, you know, an outsized number or percentage of crimes, led us to come up with a plan back what, about a year ago now, if I remember correctly, Chief, where I said to him, great, if you know who's committing a lot of these crimes, let's, let's focus in on those folks and put it on my radar. And, and so he got me and my team a list of a couple dozen people that they believe were prolific burglars. And some of them were doing cars, some of them were doing garages, what have you. They got us that list and every couple of months they updated it for us. My charging team really focused in on those people. Every time they came across our radar, we looked at what we could do. And sure enough, um, we've not only secured criminal convictions against the majority of them, but the rest are either in custody on electronic monitoring or some kind of probation at this point. Uh, that's made a difference. It just has. You look at the, at the rates of, of burglaries and they're not going up, they're flat. Doesn't mean we don't wanna bring them down, we do. We've got, we've got work ahead of us, but that kind of collaboration and communication is making a big difference. Something else that's coming up, and this is a question uh, for you, Chief Scott. 
um, a, a lot of folks have said that they've in some form that they've had some interaction. They've you know called up uh, SFPD um, and you know told them about a theft, and an officer said something to the effect of, "Hey, there's no point in pursuing this person because the DA won't prosecute." You know, and something say, you know. I get that an officer has his own mind, but so you know they don't have to do their job. Or why is that talking point allowed um, by police? Or, or do you hear this? Well, it's not allowed, and 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 look, it's unacceptable. We should not be saying that when we find out about officers saying that, and when we have uh, we have disciplined officers, and we'll continue to do so. Because if I'm calling the police for help, that's not what I'm calling for. That's not what I want to hear. Our job is to do our jobs. And part of that is not to make commentary on, you know, what somebody's personal view, whatever that might be, on uh, what the district attorney or the judges or anybody else may or may not do. Our job is to do just that, our, our job. So it's not acceptable under any circumstances. And that's something that we take seriously. And when it's brought to my attention, you know, we address it. Uh, we've had, you know, some, some disciplinary cases where we've addressed that issue and, and held our people accountable. Um, the last thing I think the public wants to hear when they are calling us is there's nothing we can do. Um, you know, the reality might be that we don't have the evidence to pursue the case, but it doesn't stop us from doing everything we can to try to get the evidence. You know, we, we have to do our jobs and we have to do our jobs the right way. That includes having the right comportment when, we, when we're called and not give personal commentary, whatever that might be. I mean, it's unprofessional and it shouldn't be happening. So. For those callers that have experienced that, I personally apologize. I'm telling you, we are holding people accountable for that. Uh, it shouldn't happen, ever. I mean, we had a Mission Local story where this did happen. Chief, uh, sorry to take time away from the people, but how often has this come up that, that officers have discouraged uh, proceeding in a case because uh, they claim that uh, the DA won't, won't move forward with it? Well, I, I can only say what gets reported that goes into either some type of investigation or... We've, we've had some of these, you know, that it, it was dealt with with some type of formal counseling. Some of them have gone to investigations because of, of what was said. So I, I don't know what I don't know in terms of people who didn't make a complaint about it that never got to either our supervisors or our internal affairs or me. But I can tell you the ones that we that we do hear about, particularly that I hear about and our uh, our supervisors and command staff, we take that seriously. And I've I've talked about this in command staff meetings and in our all hands meetings that this is unacceptable. Uh, that's something that we should not be doing. I will say it publicly. I will say it privately. It, it doesn't promote confidence in the public and it undermines the whole process. We, we shouldn't be doing it. Guys, we've got a ton of questions here. I want to be respectful of everyone's time because um, this could certainly go on for a long time here. Um, what I would like to do is uh, look, a very big uh, thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you, District Attorney Boudin. Thank you, Chief Scott. Uh, thank you, Joe, for your time. Uh, but also, you guys put a lot of there was thoughtful conversation. I know you guys did a lot of preparation uh, as well. And I think we all learned quite a bit. I, I certainly did. Um, also, a very big thank you for everyone attending. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this. You'll receive a survey uh, after this event, so please share your feedback, um, maybe on ideas for future events that you'd like to see. Um, so the Telegraph Hill Dwellers, our next event will be an outdoors neighborhood happy hour at Bella Cora on Green Street on Thursday, September 9th at 6 p.m. Uh, after that, we're organizing a THD viewing of Seven Fingers. They're the new acrobatic performance at Club Fugazi, basically where a beach blanket Babylon used to be. Uh, please follow us on Facebook. Stay aware of what's happening. And again, if you enjoyed this event, uh, if you care about this neighborhood and want to help make it a better place, please become a member today. You don't even need to live here. It's 35 bucks for an individual, $25 for a senior, um, but it makes it possible for us to do events like this. Uh, so thank you everyone so much for your time and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Thanks, Nick. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Nick. Take care, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thanks to you, Cody.